This lecture is on simulation programming language and other software tools for simulation. Welcome to the lecture. We know from our other lectures uh, what we uh, need to have in simulation programs. Uh, so that gives us the idea, well, okay, we know what the specs are that we need to ask for from any software tool that we're going to be using for simulation, right? Uh, specifically, if we're doing, like in this course, we're doing discrete event simulation, any software tool that's going to be used for discrete event system simulation has to be able to uh, model random phenomena. It has to be able to generate random numbers. It has to be able to generate random variates by um, sampling from particular probability distributions. Um, a software tool for discrete event system simulation has to be able to move time. These simulations run over time. They're not static simulations. There has to be a simulated clock. We have to be able to ask for statistics at particular moments in time. Um, and assuming that we're using the next event approach to ma managing time, which uh, we just about always are, we have the, the um, software tool has to be able to manage a list of event notices, uh, determine the next event to occur, pass control to the routine that's going to execute uh, whatever has to be done at the time of that event. Remember, these are uh, events in a discrete event system. The system changes at discrete points in time. Finally, we're going to need to be able to output statistics, including time statistics. And uh, that's why it's special. Uh, any program is going to have to output data. Um, and will we want to output reports, graphs, tables? Sure, maybe. Lots of times we do. Um, but just about any program can probably do that. A statistics software in particular has to be able to accumulate uh, statistics uh, that change over time, time-dependent statistics. Any uh, simulation software tool is going to have some way of dealing with lists. If um, we're just using a general purpose programming language, that's going to be part of the uh, data structures facility. Um, if we're using something that's specially written for the purpose of simulation, there's got to be some list management in there. We have events waiting to occur. Those are stored in a list. We have entities waiting for service. Uh, we have entities who are in the system or in some sort of activity. They may be kept on a list as well. Um, and uh, the, the software has to be able to uh, appreciate the correct ordering. Uh, usually uh, the event notice has time attached to it, time to occur, and that's one way um, of ordering uh, one of the lists that is used to manage uh, events uh, and the, the discrete event system simulation. Um, finally, we also uh, have uh, need of error detection. Uh, and since we're talking about something that's specific to simulation, error detection can be done for um, items that are uh, values that are specific to simulation. We could be looking for things uh, that you can't look for in a general purpose uh, language. Um, you want your program to be able to detect logical inconsistencies error conditions, certain things that shouldn't be there, a negative number of customers. Uh, you should be able to uh, have um, errors that are uh, al generate alerts and then are reported to the user. We know we have specialized languages and tools for uh, building simulation programs. Uh, do we need them? Can we just use um, general purpose languages like C++ or Python, sure, why not? Um, it, it, it means that there's going to be more, uh, more work for the simulationist. Um, but of course, the, there are a lot of libraries that are available uh, for, let's say, simulation in C++ or discrete event simulation in Python. And depending on you know, the point of view that you take, uh, the worldview, are you using an event orientation or process orientation? 
uh, you may have more than one library to choose from for a particular language. Um, take a look at that table. It kind of highlights the differences. Um, the, uh, the general purpose language, um, this, this may not be true anymore, but uh, uh, up until the explosion of data science and Python, um, you might say modelers typically already know how to program. But then again, due to the explosion of STEM, Python, and data science, um, modelers are also uh, interested in learning how to program now. So yeah, that might still be true. Um, if you write your uh, simulation program in, let's say, C++, which is a general purpose language that is a very efficient language, it's closer to the level of the machine, as opposed to, on the left-hand side, uh, something being more natural to use for simulation modeling. Um, if it's, if it's uh, closer to the level of machine, it will be a more efficient program, assu assuming that the programmer is a good programmer, so it could be. A more efficient program uh, so that it'll run faster. Is that a consideration? It's a consideration if your simulation is very large and very uh, heavy uh, and if it needs it needs to be goosed. Uh, what some people do is they translate. They might develop the model in a more specialized language and then have a, a person or a team of people who translate it into a general purpose language. Um, in a general purpose language, there's more programming flexibility. You can take the same program, run the simulation, have several runs of the simulation, and uh, do statistical analysis at the same time. Um, on the other hand, you see that there are more, um, more features on the left-hand side for specialized simulation software. Um, it's easier to communicate with other modelers and even with uh, non-modelers, users, supervisors, uh, very often these there are animations, uh, images that can be shown to explain what the simulation looked like or what the simulation did. It's most likely easier to validate the simulation again because you can see what it what it looked like and you can more easily, um, uh, you know, look at it, oversee it, supervise it, watch it while it's running. And of course, if you're going to have a system that checks for typical errors, uh, sure, why not use it? That'll obviously be better than not to have one. As you can already see, there are a lot of different languages and tools to use for discrete event simulation. Um, in this lecture or, and even in this course, we're not going to go into any one uh, piece of software in depth. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of doing that. There are a lot of choices. But I, what I'd like to do over the next few slides is give an overview of uh, some of the better known um, devices and tools and also a historical review of how these things develop um, over time. So the history of simulation uh, mirrors the history of um, digital computers or let's say electronic computers. Um, back in uh, the 20th century, between 1955 to around 1960, the uh, mathematical programming language of choice was Fortran. Uh, simulation researchers shared, people shared things in those days, uh, shared uh, subroutines with each other, pieces of code uh, that could be used for simulation uh, and, and be part of your Fortran. Uh, program or your Fortran library, actually much the same way that you can um, download a library in Python or C++ today. Um, then, uh, then the next uh, interval between, let's say, 1960, 61 to 1965, uh, there was an explosion of different languages and packages uh, for simulation. Um, there was SimScript, which was based on Fortran. There was Simula, uh, which was based on Algol. Um, uh, the Algol was what you might call the European version of Fortran. Fortran was very popular in the States, and Algol was very popular in uh, Europe. Um, and then a GPSS was um, 
a popular example of a package uh, or a prepackaged software tool that wasn't a general purpose language like SimScript or Simula. Um, between 66 and 1970, um, the uh, simulation programming approaches and languages um, matured. There were still a lot of development going on, uh, but much of it had to do with adapting to changes in the hardware uh, rather than uh, um, creating new innovative pieces of software um, because there wasn't that much that needed to be innovated in that area. Maybe more efficiency, certainly adapting in this case the IBM 360 to a large mainframe uh, type of computer. Same thing a few years later when uh, the um, development companies ad adapted simulation programming to uh, small computers, to desktops, mini computers, and so on. Um, in in 1980s, approximately, you had the explosion of what was then called microcomputers, uh, and um, old the the languages and software tools uh, that were developed for uh, mainframes were then redeveloped uh, for the smaller computers. Um, and as we know, as computers got smaller and smaller, their storage capacity actually got larger and larger. So it wasn't really much of a sacrifice. Um, then in the, the decades approximately between 1987 and 2008, uh, that was the age of integrated environments in a lot of different areas. So it wasn't only a simulation tool or a simulation language. The language was embedded in part of a larger environment with a GUI desktop, uh, web-based tools, uh, visualization tools, graphics, and animation. Um, and then we continue to this day with uh, further development in large-scale simulation. Uh, I'm, we're only, I'm only going to take a couple of examples of it, but uh, in, in some ways, it's changed the course of simulation because many people use the term simulation to refer to different things now, uh, nowadays. Agent-based simulation, a lot of simulation research that's going on now is on agent-based simulation and also the second item on micro simulation. Um, agent-based simulation is an individual-based modeling approach where we're looking at what does an individual entity do and what is the activity it takes part in? What, how does it interact with other individuals in the network? Um, and these, these things all have an effect on the system as a whole. Uh, the micro simulation is um, a little bit similar, except that we don't look at interactions between individual entities. Micro simulation is very, very much used for uh, policy. Uh, when there's a simulation regarding policy, it's most likely to be uh, micro simulation. Simula was uh, developed uh, as a simulation language uh, based off of Algol uh, for the UNIVAC computer, which um, was a very early uh, commercially available electronic digital computer. Um, similar to the way that SimScript was developed by the RAND Corporation, based off of Fortran, and um, I'm pretty sure it was originally developed for the IBM 360. If not, it very, very quickly morphed into that. Um, Simula was definitely the first, not only the first real simulation package, I shouldn't say that because SimScript was also, but you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, Simula was composed of objects that could interact classes and inheritance, much like any object-oriented language today. Um, it had almost everything that an object-oriented programming language like C++ has, uh, except it didn't have what's, what we call methods. Um, so the descriptions of the objects were static uh, rather than also being dynamic. Um, and still, uh, you, you can see where the object environment was, is an excellent environment for building uh, simulations where you do have things that interact in some way. And um, it's nice to have 
objects. Objects have attributes, they have data, um, and they can inherit from other objects just to make the coding easier. Why is all of this interesting? It's interesting because of the effect that all of this had on what we do today. Uh, Simula um, was uh, used to develop the language called Smalltalk, which was used for simulation. Uh, it was developed at um, a Xerox Park, their research center. And um, Smalltalk ultimately influenced the development of C++, uh, which then is the granddaddy of all object-oriented programming, meaning just about every programming language we use today. Um, that's the software side. Uh, on the other side, which is, it's also software, but it feels more like hardware to us when we're looking at the way our, our desktops, our GUI desktops are, are configured. I guess um, we're looking at the environment. Um, Smalltalk had everything we see that we think of as the desktop. Uh, it had icons. It used a pointing device. I don't remember if it was a mouse or a joystick. You can point, you could click. Um, and when you clicked, it opened up a routine. So there was a, uh, this was a routine that was waiting to be done until somebody clicked. It's almost like an event routine in a simulation. Um, and why do I have 1979 Steve Jobs over there? Uh, because the folks at Xerox Park um, we were, did this research, they developed this language, Smalltalk, um, that had both uh, the GUI desktop and the object-oriented programming uh, for simulation purposes. And they had a, a visit from uh, Steve Jobs um, of Apple fame, innovative guy. And uh, he, they, they made him wait. He wanted to see what they were doing. Uh, they, they were happy to show him, but they wanted to make sure they were allowed to because it was Xerox and it was proprietary. And one of the more interesting stories in um, the history of programming is how Xerox uh, handed over the GUI desktop to Steve Jobs because they didn't feel it was worth anything. Um, and in um, at some point, you should look this up. I, I probably should put the source in this lecture or maybe I'll put it in the comments. Uh, there's an article uh, that uh, talks about this. But at some point, the folks at Xerox said, oh, OK, fine, let him in. You can show it to him. I, we don't care. We don't need it because we, we copy paper. You know, we, we have copiers. And if we can't figure out uh, the revenue that uh, something's going to give us because it doesn't translate to number of pennies per page, uh, then it's not useful to us. That's, that's their business model. They didn't want to hear anything else. Um, so Steve Jobs came in and, and they showed him around. They were all very, very happy to show him their work. And he said, you know what? You can keep the small talk. I don't need that. All I want is the desktop. And that GUI desktop eventually was built into the Lisa. After that, the 1984 Mac. And then the rest is history because non-Apple devices had to have it too. And um, so the, the Windows desktop was developed because of that as well. Nobody uses um, desktops that are not uh, GUI anymore, that are, that do, are, are not graphical. Um, if anybody wants to know an example of what the desktop was before, all you have to do is ask somebody about MS-DOS. Uh, no one was really very happy with it. You should have in your vocabulary uh, and it should be on your radar. Some of the uh, better known and widely known um, simulation languages and tools. Uh, one very powerful one is SimScript. SimScript can be used for anything. It's a regular general programming language and it also has specialized simulation tools. Um, and as you as you we talked about, it was uh, developed from Fortran originally. And um, it was developed by the Rand Corporation uh, under a, a fellow by the name of Harry Markowitz, who you might know from his work on portfolio theory, which earned him a Nobel Prize. 
Um, and uh, interestingly, it was um, sponsored by the US Air Force. And I mention that because a lot of the work on uh, computers, on software systems, and on simulation in particular, and certainly on networks, uh, was sponsored by the military uh, for, for their own needs. And then eventually, um, it became the domain of the world at large. Um, there are, if you're, if you're a person who is actually going to be learning or working with SimScript, um, there are, it, the way to learn it is by thinking of it in terms of uh, levels, even though it has five levels, but still levels one through three are what you might call general programming that you can use for any program you write. Uh, level four has to do with data structures. And if anybody here wants to learn data structures really well, uh, pick up a little sim script because it has the most uh, free form and yet uh, extensive um, data structures vocabulary ever. It's in terms of the, the data structures uh, um, coding uh, is not uh, difficult to see. It's not difficult to read. Uh, it's in terms of entities, attributes, lists. English, it's exactly the way you might describe data structures in conversation. And then finally, level five are the things that are specific to simulation. The timing routine, the clock, random variables, uh, events, and so on. Um, Dynamo and languages based off of Dynamo uh, is uh, considered a language for systems dynamics modeling. Um, and uh, it's, it's deterministic, not stochastic generally. Um, it looks at aggregates. It's, um, it, it looks at uh, its continuous simulation flow. It's used for population systems um, where you want to see a change in uh, large population systems over time. Um, economic systems, urban dynamics. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the micro simulations I think um, have a debt to uh, systems dynamics modeling. They do it differently, um, but the end result uh, very often looks a little bit the same. Uh, Arena is a very easy to learn um, graphical uh, uh, language software tool for simulation. Um, it does um, some animations. Um, it, the graphics show the model flow, so it's easy to explain to people. And on the website of this course, uh, there are some uh, notes and uh, pointers under the, the software heading on, on ARENA. A little bit, of, kind of, quite extensive, more than we have for other languages. Um, there are very, very highly specialized software tools for simulation in particular application areas. Uh, like healthcare, manufacturing, communication networks. Uh, GPSS, I list here mainly because I want th this is the area where I, I want you to get used to the names of, of uh, well-known simulation languages, whether you're using them or not. And GPSS doesn't seem to be used much anymore. Um, it's hard to find. Uh, it may even be, it, it may not be uh, supported and in any of its um, configurations. But uh, for a long, long time, it was uh, the go-to simulation tool. Um, at some point, IBM stopped offering it. And uh, I think IBM only supported it for a mainframe and other smaller companies uh, ar arose to the, to the challenge and uh, developed it for smaller computers. But it didn't. Uh, then it, it it somehow petered out. It had a good it had a good show for a good long time. In this lecture, uh, we have looked at simulation languages and software tools. Uh, we have looked at what should be in these tools. What are the specs? What do we desire? What do we need in order to do simulation modeling? We have looked at the historical perspective, uh, the important languages over a timeline. Um, we looked at this very briefly. Uh, you will be able to find, if you try, uh, more uh, detailed and involved uh, timelines, uh, specifically um, at the Winter Simulation Conference, which is the major conference in simulation. 
Um, and finally, um, where we discussed what you might call the language, the vocabulary of simulation in terms of um, the specialized simulation programs uh, and what you would be expected to know uh, if you are a simulation modeler. Thank you for attending my lecture.